All right. Now, Genesis chapter 13. If you remember at the end of, um, or in, in chapter 12, is the story when Abraham, um, there was a, a famine in, the, in the, the land that God told him to go into, and he went down into Egypt to sojourn for a while just to be there temporarily. And that's when he told Sarai to, to say that he's his, you know, she's his sister and because um, he was worried about being put to death and everything else. But now in chapter 13, the famine's over. They're coming back into the promised land. They're leaving. They've left Egypt. Um, and now he's coming back. In verse number one, it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with them into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Now I'm going to pause on this point a little bit because it says here we see that Abram was a rich man. He had a lot of cattle. He had a lot of silver. He had a lot of gold. He had a lot of earthly possessions. He, he's considered rich. He was considered wealthy according to the Bible. Now, um, Lot also was rich. And we see a little bit later, and we'll get into that, where we start to have problems because they have so much stuff that they can't, they're too big. They've outgrown the limited area where they're, they're, they're living together. And um, I want to cover a little bit just about having riches in this world. And there are actually quite a few men in the Bible that, that did have riches, that, that, that did have earthly goods. Not everybody. There's, there's a mix of both. There's some that had riches, some that didn't. And some of the rich men in the Bible, they started off you know, wealthy and, and maintained that wealth throughout their life. And others had very, very humble beginnings and, and had to work very hard before they accumulated wealth. Now, Abram was already old by this time. Um, even here, even when he's just still kind of early on in, in our stories of Abram, he, he's, you know, he was like 74, 75 years old when his dad died and he finally left and, and headed into the promised land. So, I mean, he's, he's lived quite a while and I couldn't find any proof on, on how wealthy Abram was. You know, from his how you know early on it doesn't the Bible doesn't tell us. So we don't know for sure if he really worked for it or not. But that's not it doesn't really matter. Um, some of the examples that we see in the Bible of men that were wealthy were also very righteous men. Um, Job, for example, in Job one one, you don't have to turn there. Job one one says there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Of the east. So in the, in the whole area he was living, he was the wealthiest man. He was the greatest. He had the most possessions. He had all of this stuff, right? But he was also the most righteous man in the earth in those days as well. So, um, you know, one of my first points I want to make is just that don't despise people just because they have money, just because they have wealthy, because they've received some, some financial blessings from God. But um, also, as we're going to see, that's not our goal, our focus, or anything like that. There, there are men of God that have been blessed financially and, and, and have, have attained a lot of wealth. And then there's others that have not had anything, right? Blessed be both of them, and that's not going to be our focus. But I want to point out a few of these men because we have a tendency, because we are so not money-oriented, to have a perspective, you know, in, in our church, our types of churches, um, and we're going to get there in a little bit. You could turn, if you would, to Matthew um, chapter 19. We're going to see, you know, in the New Testament what Jesus says about people who are rich and how hard it is for them to get saved and everything like that. And that is a true statement, and we're going to get into that. But... Um, just understand that having money alone isn't like, it doesn't just automatically damn you to hell. There's nothing wrong or sinful about having wealth. You're not this evil person. You know, people today, especially, there's the, the 99 percenters and the 1 percent, and people want to say, oh, well, because they have all this money and stuff, they're just automatically wicked and evil. And that's just simply not true. And, and people like to look at someone who's rich or someone who has a lot of money as the enemy and oh man, you've got all this stuff, you know, like, 
There's nothing wrong with having money. Now, there's definitely something wrong with that just being your focus and that's your goal in life and I'm just working to get rich and that's what everything's all about. Yeah, that is completely wrong, way off base, and the love of money is the root of all evil. And that is, that is why people, though, have this stereotype of people who are rich as being extremely wicked. Because the love of money is the root of all evil and I would, probably, I would venture to say most people who are very rich, the, probably the vast majority of them, are very wicked as well because they love the money because that is how they got to the point where they're at but it doesn't mean that everybody is so you can't just automatically assume just because a person has a lot of money that they're automatically wicked or that they love that money we see Abraham was a very wealthy man Job was a very wealthy man but remember Job's attitude when he lost everything the Lord gave it the Lord taketh away blessed be the name of the Lord it didn't matter even though he was the, the richest, greatest man in that, of the entire East region of the world, didn't matter. It was just stuff. And ultimately, that's what it is. And, and we have to keep this in our mind. We live in such, such a, a materialistic society, such a, a, a covetous, focused on buy stuff, buying, buying, buying. This is going to give you happiness. You need to buy more. You need to make more money. You have to have more things. This is the world that we live in. And it's exceeding sinful. And it's, and it's something we need to just constantly, and you know, you'll hear me preach about this over and over again. But that's just because it's so important. It's so easy to fall into this trap of being focused on money. We need to support ourselves, but we need to make sure that that is not our priority. That is not our, our main goal. Our focus is just to accumulate financial wealth. Joseph was another man. Um, who now he didn't start off wealthy you know he he was one of the son children of israel but when his brothers you know sold him into captivity and he was in the prison for a long time and all this other stuff it wasn't until later in his life that he got promoted by pharaoh to be over everything pharaoh said um and i have the scripture here it says thou shalt be over my house and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled only in the throne will I be greater than thou. He's like, you're in charge of everything. He was, essentially, Joseph was the ruler. He says, the only thing that you're not going to have is the throne. He's like, I am still at the top, but you're doing everything else. You are in charge. You're running the show. And then it says, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, see, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And, you know, it says all this stuff. He made him ride in his chariot and people bowed down before him and everything else. And he attained this extremely wealthy position and position of great power. But Joseph was still a godly man. He was someone that feared the Lord. And he wasn't after all of these things. That wasn't his goal, but he ended up getting blessed with that stuff. Job was the same way. Abram was the same way. And you remember King Solomon. The Bible says in 1 Kings 10, 23, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. He sought the right thing, and God blessed him for that. God, when, when God spoke to Solomon and, and he asked him, what, you know, name what you want, so Solomon said, oh, I want wisdom. I want to be able to, to lead these people in and out. And God blessed him for that. He says, okay, I'm going to grant that to you. And guess what? Not only am I going to grant that to you, but because I'm so pleased with what you asked for, with where your heart is, with what you're trying to do, when you had an opportunity to ask for anything in the world that you wanted, you asked for this, that makes me happy. So I'm going to, I'm going to bless you with finances. You know? And he says, if you follow me, Length of days as well. You'll live a long life if you just continue to just, to just live according to my word. Now, um, we also see what happens to Solomon. Solomon explains in, in the book of Ecclesiastes how he, um, you know, he, he basically didn't keep anything back from himself. He allowed himself to, and, I mean, he didn't keep himself from women. He had, a, he had a 700 wives and 300 concubines. He didn't keep himself from it. He said, he says, you know, he, he ended up drinking just to see what, what it was all about. He ended up doing all of these different things. I built me great works. I've done all this stuff. And he's like, it's all vanity. He's like, I have, I have all this money. I could do all this stuff. And at the end of the day, it's vanity. It's meaningless. Vanity, that's all it means. It's just meaningless. So it's, there's no profit to any of it. Because he's like, I have all this stuff. I've done all these great things. I've worked real hard. I've done everything. And at the end of the day, 
Where is it all going to go? It's going to go to my son. How do I know what he's going to do with it? You know, who knows? He could just blow it all. It could all just be ruined. It could all go away. And that's what happened. I mean, all those riches and everything that Solomon accumulated, gone. Where is it today? Um, but even then, in, 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 you know, just after his lifetime, it all, it all got taken away and um, accounted for nothing. But um, one of the things we have to be aware of is that oftentimes having those riches can go to your head. And we'll see that in just a few minutes here too. You're in Matthew 19. Look at, look at verse number 23. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And what I'm trying to do tonight is strike the balance of understanding between having riches and verses like this that we see in the New Testament. Because these verses, verses get preached all the time, or, or frequently, I hope, about um, you know when Jesus said that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And... That doesn't mean just because you have financial wealth that you can't be saved, right? And we get a little bit more understanding of this in Mark. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 10, because he actually makes one more statement that's not recorded in the other Gospels. You know how the Gospels give sometimes slightly different accounts of everything that happened, and some give you more information than others? Mark or Matthew and Luke say basically the same exact thing, but there's one statement that's left out that is included in the book of Mark, that really gives us the full understanding of what he's talking about. About well, what do you what do you mean? Like why why can't a rich man get saved? Why why not? You know, and he explains that very clearly here. Mark ten. Look at verse number twenty three of Mark ten. The Bible reads, and Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? The same exact thing that we read from Matthew nineteen twenty three. Then in verse 24, it says, And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So it's the same other statements that he makes, but there's that one in the middle that he said that kind of clears it up and saying those that trust in riches. And oftentimes that's what happens is that when people are unsaved and they're just after the, the money and the wealth of this world and they think that since they've worked so hard and they've achieved so much in their life, that they're trusting in their wealth, they're trusting in what they've done, they're trusting ultimately in their own works, to do good, to earn everything for themselves, that that's why they can't put their faith in Christ to save them because they've done everything themselves their entire life. They're reaping their benefits and they can't humble themselves to accept a simple gift. They're trusting in their riches. They're trusting in their works, the fruit of their own labor. And obviously we cannot trust in the fruit of our own labor to save us. We have to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did for us at Calvary. But um, that's why all of these great men that we just mentioned that did have riches, Job, Abram, Joseph, you know, um, these men, Solomon, they weren't trusting in their riches for anything. They were trusting in the Lord. They were trusting in God and they happened to have riches. So, now, it is a truth, and these statements are very true, and anyone who's gone out soul winning in the nicer areas, the, the more affluent areas where, where there's nice houses and three-car garages and you know, all this stuff, and you get to, I mean, people are, just have a lot more wealth and a lot more money. They have a tendency, it, it's actually <coughs> almost ironic the way people are a lot more angry and don't give you the time and they're not very friendly in those communities when you go out just with the Bible and trying to, trying to tell them how to get saved as they are in the poorest areas. I've been, you know, people, are, people have it backwards. They think, <gasps> you know, you, you, you go into that neighborhood. You know, you go into South Central Phoenix. You go, you go into these areas and you're not afraid. You know, don't you know people get shot there? Don't you know people get mocked? It's like, 
when I go into those neighborhoods, by and large, the people are very friendly and will oftentimes even invite me into their house and they're, they're, they're receptive and open to hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ way more. I mean, not everyone, of course. There's, there's always people who aren't going to want to hear it. But it's a lot more than when you go into the really nice areas where you would think, hey, these people are classy. Hey, these people are nice. They're, they're going to be real friendly to you. Even if they don't want to listen, you know, they'll just politely ask you, no, that's not been my experience or anyone that I've ever talked to has experienced. Normally, those are the ones that are most often slamming the door in your face and cursing you out and telling you to get out of here. And the reason why is because they don't, they don't have a need for anything. They've met all their needs. What do they need God for? They've done everything on their own. They've worked with their hands. They've, they've amassed themselves this wealth. They have everything that they are. They're very comfortable. Versus the people who live in the poor areas, they need help. They're looking for someone to save them. They're looking for, for God. They're looking for, for that help. They're all, they've already been humbled by and large as opposed to the people who live in wealthy areas. And when you're trusting in your riches, when you're trusting in your own works, you have a proud attitude. And that pride will always keep you from just relying and resting on the Lord and trusting Him to save you. So while, yes, it is important to work, yes, it is important, I've gone over this in a, just a recent sermon, to, to work and provide for your family, those are the right reasons, but it's not to just accumulate wealth for yourself. In, um, in the book of Psalms, verse 62, the Bible kind of helps explain to us you know, if you happen to do get riches, if you do get wealthy, because it could happen. I mean, you never know what's going to happen in your life. For, you never know what opportunity might come your way, and that'll be a great opportunity. It's not going to pull you away from church, and it's not going to, you know, cause you to, to, to not serve the Lord, but it just happens to be a great blessing. You get a great raise or another job or something like that. You may find yourself in that situation, but you need to know how to deal with that type of situation as well so that your heart doesn't stray from the Lord, so that you don't let these riches get into your head or get into your heart and get so focused on them where that becomes your priority. Psalm 62 verse 9 says, Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. So vanity is, of course, meaningless. He's saying, you know, men of low degree and men of high degree, it doesn't matter. That's, that's, they, don't, they don't weigh as much. You have the, the scales, the balance. You have va vanity on this side, and you have men of low degree and men of high degree on this side. They're saying that vanity is, is heavier. And vanity is meaningless. It's nothing. So that's, you know there's not much weight to vanity. It means nothing. And they're saying, whether you're a man of low degree or a man of high degree, doesn't matter. It's less than vanity. He says in verse 10, trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. If it happens, don't set your heart on that. Don't, don't just be so focused on that blessing, on that, on that increase of riches that you have. Verse 11, God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. God pays you based on your work. He doesn't render to you based on how much money you made. Your boss does that. that, that you get the reward for your work, you know, for a boss financially. But the work that you do for the Lord is not the same as the work that you do for us. When I, when I write my computer code, God's not up there saying, oh man, you're getting all this rewards because you're working, you know, you're doing, the, you're writing this code for your boss. That's not, he, you know, I'm getting that reward financially from my boss. I need to do the Lord's work for me in order to receive his reward. And that's why he's saying, I'm going to reward you according to your works. It doesn't matter if you're of low degree, it doesn't matter if you're of high degree. What you do for me is that's going to be the reward that you receive. God's not a respecter of persons. Um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 30, and I'll read from you from Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah 9, 23 says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, 
judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in those things I delight, saith the Lord. God's saying, look, if you have a lot of wisdom, don't glory in that. If, you have, if, you, if you're a mighty man, if you're real strong, don't glory in that. If you have a lot of riches, don't glory in that. Those aren't things to, to boast yourself up about and be proud about and be like, look at how smart I am. Look at how strong I am. Look at how much money I have. He said, if you're going to glory about anything, glory in the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for His loving kindness and His judgment and His righteousness. And I know that God. That God is my Savior. That's what I'm going to glory in. It has nothing to do with my physical strength or the amount of money I have. He's saying that's what you ought to glory in. And because you know why? That's what God delights in. When His children are glorying in Him and giving Him honor and praise as opposed to themselves, when the, when the creation is actually giving glory unto the creator instead of the creation just honoring itself. That's what God loves and that's what makes God happy. Proverbs chapter 30, look at verse number 7. Proverbs 30 verse number 7 says, Two things have I required of thee. Now notice, I thought this was also interesting that this statement, you know, the, the vast majority of the book of Proverbs was penned down by Solomon, but Proverbs 30 and 31 were not. Proverbs, um, and this is in Proverbs 30, so these are not the, the Proverbs of Solomon. Verse number 7 says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. And this is a very great prayer to ask God that... God doesn't let you get real poor. You know, God, don't, don't let me just, just get to the point to where I might consider stealing and, and sinning against you in order to eat because, because I get so hungry. And also, God, don't, don't bless me so much with so many riches that I just forget about you. And I say, well, who is the Lord? Because I've gotten all this stuff to me. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, he had that type of an attitude. He said, look at this great kingdom that I have for myself. And God had to humble him and he made him like a beast of the field. And you know, for seven years he was out eating grass like an ox and, um, until you know, he understood that God's the one that lifts up and God's the one that brings people low. And he had to be brought low and humbled because he was lifted up in himself based on his position, based on where he had been, because he is the ruler of this great kingdom. And it was a great kingdom, but it wasn't because of him. God's the one that delivered all those people into his hand. It wasn't his awesome might and strength. It was that God was letting these things happen and causing these things to happen. There's no way if the children of Israel had been right with the Lord and had been trusting in the Lord, there's no way that Nebuchadnezzar could have taken him over. Not a chance. Not even one. But God was bringing his judgment against them. It doesn't matter if he had all the armies of the world against them. If the Lord was on their side, they wouldn't have lost. But God wasn't on their side. He allowed that to happen. He allowed the judgment to come. We want to, you know, it's good for us. It's good for yourself. And it's, this is the wisdom that we get from Proverbs 3 is understanding that as much as you might think having a whole bunch of money is going to solve all your problems, it's not. That is not the answer. You're never going to get rid of all the problems in your life just by having more finances. It, you'll never have enough for that to go away. Never. There's always going to be new problems. There's always going to be something else. I've lived in, in various econo you know, economic status since I've been on my own, whether you know, struggling and up to the point where I'm at today, which I'm still struggling. <laughs> now, I happen to have more money than I did back then, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I think there's always going to be a struggle, and that's fine. And as long as you're not, you know, to the point where you're stealing, then praise the Lord, that's great. And, you know, you don't have just so much stuff that you're, it gets to your head and you're saying, well, where is, you know, who is the Lord? I did all of this stuff. And I don't want to be in either one of those situations, honestly. I, I think this is, this is very wise to have this type of an attitude. Now, look, if you would, at um, Proverbs chapter 13, since you're in Proverbs this is one of my favorite verses. I actually have this, um, this proverb on my desk at work, just written on an index card. I have a few things, um, a few verses that I have that are relevant, uh, in my opinion, to me working and, and to keep myself right. And um, Proverbs 13, 7 says, There is that maketh himself rich 
yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. And that's to remind me, because I like to work, I'll work a lot, I've worked a lot of overtime, like, all my life. I'll do a lot of work, but I need to keep this focus in my life, that it's not about those riches. There, you can have all of the physical wealth in this world, yet, according to the Bible, you're poor, you have nothing. But then there's people who are poor, you don't have a lot of money, yet you have great riches. And it's all about the right priorities and who's giving you your reward. Are you getting it physically from your boss on this earth or are you getting it from the Lord in heaven? Now, obviously, I'm still working and doing my job. I'm not, you know, like doing a bad job at work. I mean, the work that you do should always be a good job. But that is to remind myself not to get so focused and driven only on that making money and only on that, that type of work that I keep the things that are really important in mind so that I can prioritize my schedule appropriately to do the work, make sure I'm doing the work that's important, that I can be rich in God's eyes and not poor and not have nothing. Um, let's go back to Genesis chapter 13. So where were we at? Oh yeah, verse number two. So now let's go to verse number three. <laughs> Buckle up, we're in for a long ride. <laughs> Verse number three. <coughs> and he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. So he goes back to where he was originally. He comes out of Egypt, and he goes back to where he was. Verse number four. Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So they've accumulated so much, they, much, they go back to the place where they were before. And they've just amassed so much wealth that there's, you know, they're starting to have problems. Now, it's not a direct problem between Abram and Lot. This hasn't happened yet. But Abram identifies this. He's saying, okay, look, our employees, you know, the people working for us, they're starting to fight over this because... You know, they're fighting over the land. Hey, you know, you're eating this grass and this is, you know, our, our area and, you, you know, you need to stay over there or whatever. But because there's just not enough room for everybody to be there. Abraham recognizes this and he's saying, okay, we need to do something about this. Um, I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to get to this point. And that's, you know, oftentimes these types of problems can lead to having a, a fight between people that you love, between family, between friends, between church members, whatever it may be you know, because of, I want to say, kind of stupid things like this. Ultimately, those riches don't really matter that much. You don't want that to be the cause to drive a wedge between a good relationship that you have with somebody. So, Abraham recognizes this. He sees this. And we see a, an awesome spirit that Abraham has. Very wise, very humble, and, I mean, just a great man. He, he doesn't want to fight. Now, he had all the right in the world because he was essentially raising Lot. I mean, Lot was there. Now, at this time, I'm sure Lot, you know, Lot was a grown man, of course. You know, Abram was much older. But he was still the elder. He was the one who had been taking care of him, had brought him along with him, watching out for him. You know, and, and he's honestly probably the reason why Lot even had as much stuff as he did because they were both being blessed by God. Because God had already told Abram, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him and curse thee. And I'm sure Lot was blessing Abram. And um, he received some of that blessing. But um, he had, he, you know, there would be no problems. He had the authority to say, all right, Lot, you know, I'm going to go over here. You go over there and we'll just not have any fights. Right? He could have done that. And he would have been right in doing so. Nothing wrong with that. But he really... For one, I don't think he cared that much about it because he had the right attitude. He had the proper attitude about his wealth. 
He let Lot make the decision. He's like, you know what? I'm going to let you decide. Here, the land's open for you. You want to go to the left hand, I'll go over to the right. If you choose to go to the right, I'm going to go to the left. Okay? I just don't want to have any fights between us. And you know, that's a sign of a really good leader where, where he's able to humble himself and just say, okay, you know, like, like take what you want. I'm good with it. And um, the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 18, a wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. And this is exactly what Abram is doing here. He's appeasing a strife. Now, again, I don't think it happened to the point where they were at strife with each other, but it was already, he, he noticed and spotted the beginnings of it. Their you know, there's already at the low level starting to have this problem and fighting where it's going to reach its way up to where they're going to have to make a decision on how to handle it. And it would have been easy for him to say, you know, Lot, your servants, they were, you know, they've been coming over into my territory and they've been doing all this stuff. What's up with that? You know, and then starting this whole problem over something. I mean, whoever might have been in the wrong, either one could have been doing that and saying, you know, you need to get your men under control. You need to fix this. You need to do all this other stuff. But Abram didn't handle it that way. He says, he recognized and said, you know what, this isn't, this is going to keep going on. This, you know, there is no good solution to this except we just have so much stuff we need to kind of split up a little bit. We need to separate from each other distance-wise, physically, to just be able to, to handle all the wealth that we have. And he was a wise man, and, and he's appeasing this strife. Proverbs 17.1 says, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than in house full of sacrifices with strife. The Bible is saying, you know, it's a lot better to have a little bit, you know, a dry, just a small piece of food, a dry food with quietness, with peace, than it is to have your house full of sacrifices, full of wealth and goods, but have a lot of fighting all the time. I mean, who wants to live in a place where there's just fighting going on all the time? And God forbid that all that fighting would just be as a result of money, right? It's a lot better to not have the money, but just have the peace. Just have a place where we can get along and everything would be good. And who cares about the money? You know... We're in a, in a great house. We love each other, whatever. If it's, you know, spouse or, or just family members, whatever, uh, wherever you're living, you know, it's much better to have the quietness than to have all this abundance and still just have a bunch of fighting. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3 says, For are ye yet carnal, for, excuse me, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? It's carnal for us to have these types of fightings and strifes with each other, which, again, Abram was avoiding this strife, this fighting, and it leads to the envying and the divisions, um, all this fighting. We need to be able to, to spot it right away and be able to deal with it appropriately. Um, one of my favorite verses in Philippians chapter 2, real famous verse, Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness... Tell me if this doesn't define Abraham. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Abraham was looking unto Lot's stuff and saying, Okay, you know, we've got too much stuff. I'm going to esteem you better. You make the choice. Pick whatever is good to you. You know, pick the good land. Pick the best land that there is. Go ahead and take it. It's your which, whatever you want. Go ahead and take it. Because Abraham was a peacemaker. Turn if you would to James chapter 3. We're going to be right back in Genesis 13. But go to James chapter 3. We want to be able to identify strife. We want to be able to identify problems before they really blow up and become big problems. And before they turn into problems that, you know, people say things or do things where then all of a sudden it becomes really hard to um, patch up a relationship. Abigail, put that down. Oftentimes people will say things and you can't take back the things that come out of your mouth. And things are said in anger, in fightings. And once you say it, man, that's out there. And it can't be unsaid. So if you can identify the cause of a strife or a problem early on, try to, when you identify that, try to be humble and try to be the leader that Abraham was 
and to look well on these things and just know in your heart and know in your head that this strife is not going to be good. It's not going to produce anything fruitful. I'm going to try to deal with this problem and look well to other people and just offer an option and, and here we go. You, you know, we can do this and um, you know, not have to, to lift yourself up in this manner. And that's exactly what Abraham did with Lot. And James chapter 3, you're there now, look at verse 14. It says, but if ye have bitter envying, and notice how like in, in a lot of these verses, envying and strife go hand in hand. When you envy someone else's stuff, when you're looking at what someone else has, it leads to fighting. Especially when you're close to someone like, you know, Lot and Abraham, that was his uncle. You know, like if one of them just had a lot more stuff, he's looking at it and envying it, that's going to lead problem, to problems. It's going to lead to, um, to strife and fighting. He says, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual. Look at this last word, devilish. So if you have bitter envying in your heart and strife, he said, that's devilish. That wisdom doesn't come from above. That doesn't come from God. Abigail, stop that right now. Put that down and don't pick it up again. Verse number 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, of them that make peace. Abraham was one that made peace. He was the one that, that used his wisdom from above, the wisdom that God gave him, godly wisdom, to be pure, peaceable, gentle. He was easy to be entreated. I don't think anybody looked at Abraham like, oh man, I don't think I could ask him to, to do something for me because that guy just flies off the handle every time you go to him with a question. I mean, who here has had bosses like that before where like you just, as I know I have, you don't even want to like open up the door to their office. You want to see like, are they having a good day today? And you're like, you just want to ask like just a normal question about your job or something. And you're like, Mm, maybe I'll just wait. And like a lot of people, there's bosses like that and people won't even say anything and they'll end up doing a lot of things wrong and then getting in worse trouble and it's because they don't even want to go and ask it because their boss is not easy to be entreated. And that's just not wise. It's foolish to be that way. If you're just flying off the handle every time someone asks you a question, that's, that's not wise at all. That is not using godly wisdom. You're going to want people to come and, and ask you questions otherwise something worse could happen. But um, you know, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. This is exactly what we see in Abraham when he was offering to Lot to have the choice of what he wanted to do. He put him first. He esteemed others better than himself. But now let's look at Lot. What choice did he make? Because they both had choices to, you know, to deal with this situation. Abram was the one who spotted it, identified it, and he said, you know, I'm going to make peace. I'm going to solve this right away. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to just allow Lot to take, go which way you want. We need to do this. We need to separate. So go ahead and pick the way that you want to go. It's fine with me, whatever you choose. Now, Lot could have been like, you know what? It's my choice. That area is a lot better than this area. Abram, you deserve it. You've helped me out. You've taken care of me. You've done all this nice stuff. I think you should have the good land and I'm just going to go over here. But is that the choice a lot made? No. He says, oh wow, this land is great. Hey, this is well watered. This is like the land of Eden. I'm going to go over here. You can go over there a lot. I'm going I'm to take this land. Thanks. And that gets Lot into trouble, that choice. Let's go back to Genesis 13. We're going to see what happens. It, it, it would have done Lot way, 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 way better for his life if he would have been humble, if he would have esteemed others better than himself, and if he would have said, even though this is the better land, I'm going to let you take that because I'm going to take this over here. And we see where this, ends, where this lands Abram and where it lands Lot. We know Abram received all the blessings of God. And Abram's seed was promised to be as the sand is by, which is by the seashore. That's a major blessing from God. But Lot, on the other hand, we, we know how Lot's life went because we've read the Bible before, but let's look at, um, 
Let's see, where did we leave off here? Verse number 10. So here's, here's where we see Lot's choice. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord. He's like, just like the garden of Eden. It's just like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now, that phrase right there, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. What happens in the very next chapter? Let's jump ahead to chapter 14. Because just in chapter 13, verse number 12, we see Lot, he, he takes that good land and he points his tent and he's looking right at Sodom. He's not in Sodom, but he's just, that's the direction that he's headed. He's pointed towards Sodom. Verse, chapter 14, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. So by the time we get to chapter 14, Lot's already in Sodom. Now, he started off distant, you know, a distance away. He wasn't in Sodom, but he was away from it. And look at verse number um, 13. The Bible says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So even then, they were wicked. They were ungodly people. Yet, Lot just had his tent pointed towards Sodom. And this is the warning we need, to, we need to heed from this chapter. You can start off looking, you know, just like Lot, he started off looking at Sodom, didn't, wasn't doing anything, just looking at it, it was just, just out his front door every day. Every day he wakes up, goes out his tent. Oh, look, there's Sodom. Oh, look, there's Sodom. Oh, look, there's Sodom. His tent's pointed right towards Sodom. Before you know it, he's in Sodom. This is exactly how it works with sin in your life. You can be like, well, I'm not doing this sin, but I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it every day. I'm turning on the television. I'm looking, I'm looking at other people commit adultery every day. I'm looking at other people drink alcohol every day. I'm looking at other people do this every day. I'm putting it in front of my eyes. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. Before you know it, you're going to be doing it. You'll be doing the same exact sin. Think about the sin of Achan. If you remember the sin of Achan in the Old Testament when the, um, the children of Israel had their battles. And God told him, hey, everything is dedicated to the Lord. It's a battle of Ai. And everything is going to be dedicated to the Lord. Don't touch the accursed thing. That's not for you. And Achan, what did he do? He saw first. He looked upon it. And then he coveted it. And then he took it. And it cost him his life and his family's life. And all that he had were all destroyed because of that sin. Because he, he, he looked upon the accursed thing and then he took it after he coveted it for himself. And the more you look on things, the more you look on sinful things especially, the more your heart is going to be on those things. And you're going to end up doing them. That's why Job said, I made a, co a, a covenant with my eyes. How then shall I look upon an, on a maid? Like, and I might be misquoting that verse, but um, he's basically saying, I don't want to feast my eyes on other women, because Joel was married, and, or, yeah, he said, how then shall I touch him? It, it, wow, I totally have that verse screwed up. But um, the point is, if you're married, don't even, you know, people say, oh, well, I'm just looking at the menu, but I'm not going to order. Or, you know, I like, I can look, but I'm not going to touch, right? That's the philosophy of the world. It's a stupid philosophy. Mm -hmm. The philosophy of the world is going to lead to adultery and divorce, which, surprise, surprise, that's what's happening in the world today. When, when all the promiscuity is accepted and it's, it's promoted on the television. I mean, people watch TV every single day. I, I used to watch TV every single day for hours a day. I mean, now I'm just like, where in the world did I have the time to do that? But it was something that I used to do is spend one hour or an hour and a half, maybe even up to two hours a day, just, just getting programmed through the television programming that's going on where they're, where they're pumping out whatever it is they want you to see. The wickedness of this world, the shamefulness of, of Hollywood and Hollywood and, the, and the, the weird stuff that they think and they want you to accept and they want you to believe is just getting pumped into your head on a daily basis if you're watching that television. And just like Lot, every day, look at his tent, his 
tent is just pitched towards Sodom. He's just looking at that every day. He winds up in Sodom. The same thing will happen to you if you just point your, your eyes towards, you know, whether it be another, another woman, another man, whatever, you know, whatever situation is, you're, just, you're, you're thinking about that person, you're looking at them all the time, the next step is going to be doing it. Guaranteed. The next step is going to come. The, the, it might take a little while, but if you just keep on allowing that and you keep on allowing your eyes to look on things you ought not to be looking on, regardless of the sin, it doesn't matter what it is. I don't care what it is, but if you just allow that to happen, if for some reason you're, you're getting whatever pleasure, you're looking at that and you think it's good, Abigail, sit still. You're going to wind up doing those things yourself. Now the other point I want to point out about Genesis 13, 13 Notice it says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They were exceedingly sinful. They were sin not just regular sinners, you know, they were exceedingly sinful. And there's a there's a thing in, in modern Christianity, in the, the generic Christianity, where people will think that all sin is equal. I know I've heard this quite a bit. We go out soul winning and people will say, Oh yeah, well all sin is equal. But that is not what the Bible teaches. Right here we see that, that the men of Sodom, they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Exceedingly means a lot more. They were sinners a lot more than other people. But every sin's equal, right? All sin's equal. Well, what about when John chapter 19, turn if you would to Luke chapter 12. I'll show you Luke chapter 12. But in John chapter 19, when Jesus was, was uh, arrested and was being questioned and, and they, were, they were falsely accusing him and he was standing before Pilate, verse number 10 of John 19 says, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? You say, what? You're not going to answer me? Don't you know that, that the fate, uh, your fate is in my hands? I could either let you go or I could crucify you? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. But look at this next part. Okay, he's saying, look, you don't have any power. The only power you have is because God's allowing you to have this power. I'm not worried about you. I'm not going to bow down to you and, and um, beg you for, for mercy because you don't even have that power to begin with. The only reason you have any power is because God gives it to you. But he says, Therefore, so because of this, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. It's a worse sin that Judas did than what Pilate did. Pilate's the one that ordered Jesus Christ to be put to death. But Judas, who betrayed Jesus, he didn't physically put Jesus to death, but he had him arrested. He betrayed him. He led them to arrest Jesus Christ. He says he had the greater sin. How can a sin be greater if all sin is equal? It would be, it would be a contradiction of terms. You would just have to say, well, he, he had a sin. No, he had the greater sin. He had more sin. You're in Luke chapter 12. Look at verse number 42. Luke 12, 42. Don't let anyone deceive you with this nonsense of, oh, all sin's equal. All that is is people parroting and just repeating things that they've heard. Their, their trendy, popular pastor who you know sits on a chair and wears Hawaiian shirts and flip-flops say, oh, well, all sin's equal anyways. Probably because they're in sin and they don't, they don't want to um, people to understand how bad their life is and they just want to make everything equal say oh well we're all equally sinful that's not what the Bible teaches look at Luke 12 verse 42 the Bible says and the Lord said who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his, ho his household to give them their portion of meat in due season blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath but and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes." But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of them of him, 
they will ask the more. So here we see when someone's sinning presumptuously and they know the word and they know the truth, but they don't do it, getting punished a lot more than those that might do the same exact things, but they don't know. They're ignorant of it. Now, they still sin, but they're going to be beaten with less stripes as those who knew and understood they're going to be beaten with more stripes. And that's what the Bible teaches, that not all sin is equal. If all sin were equal, then all the punishments would be equal. But then tell me, why do they have some punishments of scourging, some punishments of you know, payment back? Even thieves, they don't have the same um, recompense of, the, of whatever they steal. If someone steals a person, we just went over this on Sunday, if someone steals a person, they're going to be put to death. But if they steal an animal, well, they got to pay back, you know, four or five times depending on the type of animal that they, they stole. And if they steal money that was lent to someone else to borrow or to, to hold on to or whatever, then it's just like twice the amount they, they give back. Different punishments because the severity of the sin is not the same because not all sin is equal. Deuteronomy 32, 22 says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. We see how can there possibly be <coughs> excuse me, a lowest hell, right? That like what would be the point of that if if all sin is equal? No, there's it's the same way with heaven. Not all of heaven is equal either. God's going to give out rewards based on the works that you do in this lifetime. Some people will be ruling over many cities and some people won't. And it's all based on our works. And I believe hell is the same exact way. Now, praise God if you're in heaven, that's great. And yes, any sin is, an, is bad enough to send you unto hell, but there are sins that are worse than others. And there are lower portions of hell that I believe that people will be burning in worse, if it could even be possible, than other people in hell. And that it'll be that much worse based on how exceeding sinful they were. And the men of Sodom were exceeding sinful. Let's finish up this chapter. Um, verse number 14 says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. So remember, they split up. And God says unto Abram, Okay, and, and Lot chose what would be seemingly looked as the better land, right? The well-watered, the, the, the great area. He says, look on all this land, Abram, verse 15, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Abram's the one that ended up getting blessed. He's like, look to the north, south, east, look all around you, Abram. This is all going to be yours. And what happened to Lot's land that he had? It got burned up. Right? Remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he also burned Zoar and the cities that were all around it too after he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And that land is uninhabitable to this day. And that's what happened when he, in his eyes, he's getting the good deal. He's getting the great thing. But in the grand scheme of things, nope. Abraham's the one that was blessed. Why? Partially because of his attitude, because of his spirit, because he was humble, because he looked well on the things of others, because he saw strife and he didn't want to have any part of it. He wanted to end that strife before it even got, got out of hand. All of these things is, you know, just, just exemplifies how great of a man Abraham was and a great leader. And these are all qualities that we should look to and strive to have in our life. Don't, don't try to have, attain all this wealth. Don't um, get sucked into the deceitfulness of riches. Don't, you know, um, don't let anyone tell you that all sin is equal. And um, just remember to esteem others better than yourself. And let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for this great example that Abraham gives us. We know he had his mistakes. We saw some of his mistakes in the previous chapter, dear Lord. But he also was such a great man of faith and a great man of God. Lord, oh, we thank you for, for providing um, your words to us to, to tell us what type of man he was that we could model ourselves 
after these, these great qualities that he had that were godly qualities, that was wisdom from above, dear Lord. Help us all to gain this wisdom. Help us to not fight about things that, that are meaningless and vanity, like, like the amount of money we have, dear Lord. Help us to, to not have strife in our homes, but that we would grow closer to you, dear Lord, and grow closer to each other and, and not um, be so worried about the, the financial or the, the material things of this world, but to be more focused on serving you and that we could we can know that proverb that um that there is that is poor yet hath great riches and we know that even if we don't have money we could still be very very rich in the lord if we just have the faith to know that you will reward us one day when we get to heaven if we're doing your will it's in jesus name we pray amen